gentlemen, may I have everybody's attention, please? So this is a very exciting weekend for Gallery North with the phenomenal reception we had last night. There were so many people here. It was really, really wonderful to see. And the poetry reading now and tomorrow we're having an art talk. You'll see that, um, as you all know, we have poetry books here. We have Pamanak. We have some of Claire's work. We have... Oberon, we have whatever, everybody knows that I am very pleased to have any of the poetry books, any of the writing incorporated in our gallery shop, and there is a bookshelf in there. So afterwards, I invite you to go take a look. We often have things here in the front, but because when we have an opening, we need the front desk, and you know, it's all, we're always moving things around. But please go in after and take a look at the books there and enjoy them and uh, take them home, buy them of course, but take them home with you so you can enjoy them again. The cookbooks in the middle room on that shelf um, are not for sale. They're part of my own collection. I've been collecting cookbooks for some reason. One thing led to the next and I have quite a few. And this is part of the artist collection. So in some way or another, it's cookbooks that artists have created or conversations. There's one from Guild Hall. There's the Museum of Modern Art and so on. And they're fun. And you may look at those, but you may not take them away. And I think that's everything. We're going to start today with Claire. Claire Nicholas White. The microphones are right here. <coughs> Do we need them? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Well, this is called soup. I feel soup is a metaphor for life. So, when you're feeding the rest, just throw it, throw it all in. The core and the skin, the stem and the leaf, the pit and the pain. Then stir and forget. Let time do its thing, till the smell of the broth and the sting of the spice will rise to the roof like, like a song and awaken the need to keep tasting the brew. I'm not going to be doing a reading. Instead, I'm doing a poetry project. Uh -huh. And I'd like to ask the audience, what would you like to throw in to the soup? And so I've got uh, pads, and I've got pencils, and I've got a box. Whatever you want to throw in, it's up to you guys. I'll leave it up to your creativity. I'm going to pass the box, and I'm going to pass the pencils around. And when are you collecting them? I'll be collecting them in this box. And what I'm going to do with them, once I um, have this little collection, I'm going to put together a collaborative poem with everybody's work, and we're going to post it on the Facebook page of Gallery North. And then, you know, if there's um, space on the desk, as Judith said, maybe we'll put that poem there. When visitors come by, they'll pick up a little collaborative poem in celebration of Poetry Month, which, of course, is April. So thanks. I'll, I'll start passing. I'm going to read two poems today, so it's exciting. My first poem is called Anchovies, and it's by Judy Sicucci. Hermetically sealed, cloistered, Breathless and blind, they are doomed and exiled like lost women, anonymous and trapped. After they are brined, flesh, flesh softened with oil, they are deaf and silent, dumb, no volition left. They fall with their sisters into the net of domesticity. Once they dreamed of flowers swimming and levitation and escape where they would rise above themselves on mystical wings. It is the salt from their tears you taste in your motionless meal. The next one is by Aurel Protopopescu, and it's called The Ballad of Tart Tartan. Tartan. Anointed with flour with sugary butter, with firm red apples baked golden brown, you were our queen of tart, tartan, wearing your hair like a golden crown. 
You flip the tin, set the tart on a plate, the apple side up and the crest side down. We ate it with cream as pale as your skin and you smiled. I'm having trouble with this, excuse me. Yeah, I, you smiled, uh, where are we? Like a dream in your velvet gown. Once, only once, did you burn a crust. How you cried, how he tried to calm you down, stroking your hair, your bright, wavy hair, coiled on your head in a braided crown. You hated the taste of your own despair, yet you drank and you drank from that bitter cup. Then you flipped yourself over, lively as light, brushed off the ash, and turned good side up. But what could we do with the poison cup that burning your lips turned us upside down? Now we'll never again taste your tart tan. Never dance in the glow of your lovely crown. We eat frozen soup in this wintry time and it tastes dry as death, that bitter lime. I apologize for the emotion. Um, okay, who's next? Thank you. I'm new to Long Island. I've only been here a couple of months, so it's a real pleasure to be a part of a, a writing group in an event like this. So I'm, um, thank you. I'm delighted. So the title of my poem is called Wine. Last year, where I used to live in Virginia, I worked in a winery. So it was the, um, provided a lot of inspiration for various reasons. Anyway, wine. Red wine spills to the floor, fills a puddle of tears with burgundy. He's not coming back. So the poem that I have is My Family Tree. My Family Tree. Grandmom, two lumps, sweetened French tea. Granddad, two lumps, sweetened dark java. My mother, two lumps, sweetened herbal tea. My father, two lumps, sweetened dark brew. My brother denied all, chose gin instead, liked two shots up in a dirty bar glass. I like both. I'm not choosy. Two sugars, two jiggers, brew, tea, in a flirty glass, perhaps a dark Italian wine. That's it. And my poem is called Homegrown, Ode to Spring. There in the produce section, a sudden hug all round me. I was lost in her jacket, perfume, love. Did I care a fig what the onions thought about my tears? Let us not go there. She is the apple of my eye, the product of my love. Come home at last. So this is called, this is about the helicopter sound. And it's called Planting the Seeds. The storm moves on, lightning fades. The pair of swans returns to ripple, then smooth the air and water's surface. A man, a woman, near the harbor, many of them, perhaps, back from Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever war blooms. They kneel in dirt as if praying with heartfuls of seeds and they feel, rather than see, a helicopter pulse overhead, blades chopping the afternoon, thundering into them. Now, suddenly, camouflage combat anyone's morphing into flame, into dust, into open running mouths. Then they are breath pulled through yesterday's door back to this reinvented day, bequeathed to hands, planting in Forsythia Aprils what's already taking root at the sill of their memory. Thank you. That's uh, one of my beloved ones. I've um, 
I've treasured this one, and it's, it's based on a true story. It's called Salt and Sugar. Sixteen candles melted wax onto the iced landscape of a cake my mother made, covered in white hard icing over a chocolate interior. It sat on a card table, glowing. I singed some of my hair when I wished for a car. <laughs> on the second bite, I knew Mom used salt instead of sugar <laughs> for the frosting. The cake was dark, but not as moist as my eyes. I shoveled with a fork, pushing salt crusts away from that sweet brown earth. There it was, my mother's love, sugared hopes getting mixed up with honest salt, like on that hot August day I was born. Uh, Jerry Morrison is out of town. So, um, sensational bites. Secrets are divine morsels. I never hide my hunger for them, accused of a gluttonous appetite. I favor fiery jalapeno tidbits, less appealing, teary, watered-down fare. I swallow them all, bitter to sweet. Keep the courses coming, cautious about abstinent diets. I concoct trendy repasts and return Five-star gossipers always find a place for me at their tables. The tips I leave are more than generous. Um, so I'm Pramila Venkateshwar, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I'm the current Poet Laureate of Suffolk County, Long Island. I teach at Nassau Community College. Blessings. Bless the hands that have plucked grapes to make wine, hundreds of bent backs pruning miles of vineyard in winter. Bless migrant farmers, their hands riddled with calluses, stacking corn cobs chest high in supermarkets young girls and boys filling baskets with oranges under a hot Florida sun. Tired Mexicans at assembly lines and plants lining the prairie, processing meat, their fingers smelling faintly of flesh even after many a wash, bless them. This steaming mound of rice on my plate is the offering of those steering the plow through paddy fields, their fabric clinging to their flesh, moving from harvest to harvest. Oh, bless them. Bless the fingers that have plucked tea leaves in a plantation in Assam or Darjeeling, either at dawn or in the gathering dusk. Bless us with sight when we are blind to sinews and sweat of labor lacing our baskets of food. Thank you. The poem I'm reading, If You Want Dinner, uh, is a, um, at the tail of an actual event. I, went, I lived in Vermont, and my brother was visiting a farm in upstate New York, just across the border, and he invited me to come and meet the friends at the farm that he was visiting and have dinner. So I went and I was told after getting to know everybody and hanging around and looking at the farm that if, um, if I wanted to eat dinner, I had to do a chicken. And I didn't know what to I had to do a chicken. And I said, yeah, you need to know where your food comes from. And that's where this poem came from. If you want dinner, you have to do the chicken. You need to know where your food comes from. I'm escorted out back where the chickens peck and scratch. First task, catch one. I run around like, hate to say it, a chicken with its head cut off. A keystone comedy if you don't think about the final, the final scene. Finally, I sprawl on the ground, clutching the legs of my frantically squawking mark. The farmer raises me up, escorts me to the chopping block. A thick stump showing grim signs of previous use. I'm, handled a short, I'm handed a short-handled axe. No instructions needed. 
stomach in knots, hands shaking and destined for hell, I clutch the struggling legs and lay the flapping sacrifice across the altar. I raise my arm and whack twice. My heart stops, the chicken's does not. I let go and it staggers headless, then falls. I stand stunned. Then prodded by the farmer, I'm led to the kitchen to pluck and dress the offering. I look at my food differently now. Here is my poem, O oh, to Her Highness the Tomato. She grows from humble grounds, the tiny seeds flowering to fruit. Her orb, green at first, turns ochre, then rose, at last the flaming vermilion of moonlight, only to fall to knife, to slice, to salted sprigs of parsley doused with oil. Oh, let us praise this earthly sphere, her glow, her aroma, her echoes of summer's gone. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for reading the poems that we put on the walls to uh, add to our exhibition of The Art of Eating. And now that we have plenty of time, if one by one you have another poem you would like to read, I, I invite you to do that. I was just really eager for everybody to read the one that was on the wall first. So is there someone or anybody or everybody who would like to read another poem? Yes? Okay. So why don't you start, Ginger, and then people can just work backwards. I think we have all of them in the book in case you haven't brought them. And everything is um, alphabetical. And you're, I just... I have to show you this poem. I don't know if I can take this whole thing up. There it is. It's in the green. It's called Avocado. 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 Felix, this is an avocado. It comes to you on a spoon. You may not like it at first. You'll get used to it soon. Oh no, you're making that yucky face. I can see your question, why? See it in your downturned lips, the instant thrust of startled tongue. Just wait, baby, there's more to come. Sweet potato, they say, and any day now, peaches, plums, bananas, peas, and no doubt the tricky Brussels sprout. <laughs> your mother, who holds the spoon, pauses ready for the scream. Your father, who mashed this fruit, starts to smile. And your grandma, who sees the wonder in your eyes, picks up her pen to celebrate the risky magic of surprise. And one other, Possum Heart. This is a, uh, uh, actually a poem that's so dear to the heart of Felix that he has to tell this story over and over and over. So I wrote a little poem about it. It's called Possum Heart. On this day, when all have disappointed, look out your bedroom window. There in your flashlight shine, do you see his naked tail, white mask, and opposable thumbs? Do you hear those low hissing sounds? Then reach deep into your pouch of surprise, so you too could own this plenty. If only you dared to climb to the treetops. If only you knew of the red dogwood berries. And so, Rosie? Corn. The garden we planted at the bottom of the hill across the dirt road was an experiment born of joy and the freedom of place. Asparagus, tomatoes, beans and peas, cucumber, squash. Yet what stays with me is the corn. We were new to country life. The fact that corn grew at all stupefied us. But it was the gathering, the dusty walk across the road, the pot of boiling water balanced precariously so as not to slosh, the arrival in the singing, buzzing field, the warm ears snatched from the stalk, 
the stripping away of jade green husks to reveal nuggets of sunshine. Into the pot they went in their golden nakedness, then the slow walk back up the hill, the pot placed on the table, corn, gathered perfection, cooked at a walk. <laughs> Peaches, weird fuzzy skin like baby down, who dared take the first bite? Someone did. Juice running down their chin, succulent taste of sunshine, thick like sex. A big bite first and then eager nibbles around the stone, sticky lips, sticky fingers, lick them smooth. Mm. <laughs> At Hotel de Bourgogne. The romantic Port Lamartine stayed here, boasted the hotel in Cluny. Encouraged, we went to check in. The man was properly dressed for the last century. <laughs> if you want a room, you must have the meal. We agreed. The price was right. We had seen stables where horses were trained and the ruins of the abbey. Our rooms were shabby, but the meal was a ceremony. A procession of ladies in black brought us tiny dishes of this and that called pré hors d'oeuvre, then a potent consommé, a dainty fish, a tiny bird, spinach soufflé and a croquette, venison with plum compote, a leaf or two of fragrant greens, a vast array of cheese, then the desserts, carts laden with custards, tarts, chocolate mousse. A meal like that, I thought is all one needs to know of poetry. I have a poem in the shape of a tomato. Okay. <laughs> Looks like this. I even have a stalk. <laughs> <laughs> I was very proud when I made the stalk. <laughs> um, so I decided to write on genetic modification. Like, what do you feel when you're eating food that is genetically modified? Have you ever thought about that? Is there a fish in your tomato? <laughs> Each round tomato fills my hand. No wrinkle, smudge, scab, or hole pierced by worm. A work of art, I marvel. Every tomato perfectly cloned, minus rot or cleavage. But how can the shiny wonder taste so bland? Do these perfect vermilion globes crossbred from fish aim to taste more like their aquatic par parent? Will cooks turn devious when they run short of seafood? What do I know, a vegetarian, who only imagines a mean glassy eye challenging me as I munch on tomato salad? Gills, fins, smooth, pink entrails, the delicate eggs in their ovarian sac, and the stink of fishing villages assault me, breaking my tongue, teaching it the sense of genetic modification so I can cultivate this new illusion. <laughs> Thanks. Please keep mouth closed while chewing. <clears throat> I'm reading your selected poems while eating a toasted pumpernickel bagel smothered in a non-fat spread, not unlike butter, yet not actually near butter either, <laughs> except if butter existed on another planet and in an entirely different dimension. I have just finished your poem without explanation when several soggy crumbs plummet to the page blotting it with its, I can't believe they market this crap as butter goodness. <laughs> Several dark particles have slipped into the black hole of the binding, and I can't get them out, try as I might, upending the book, attempting to scrape them out with a knife, wiped clean of anything remotely like butter, of course. But they have already transcended the event horizon and are lost. I surrender too and proceed to your next poem, page right, the one entitled, 
marking my place. Requiem for sardines. The sky is blue. I wear my yellow dress as I open a can of sardines, release them from the airless tomb of Tim, where they lie helpless, head to toe binding me with their silver glimmer. Sunlight shines from their skin in passive grief. Mute and silent, they are melancholy incarnate, acquiescent as abandoned wives. I steal them from death, close my eyes, devour them. My sorrows decrease as I swallow them whole, one by one, saying a prayer of thanks for these salty gifts caught in the wake of waters. Breakfast, Citrus Ritual. And I will show you that she submitted it all orange and yellow. My thumb creeps around the orange rind, feeling for that looseness where my finger sinks in to lift the stippled skin. Its, fragrant, its fragrance whooshes out, a fresh pungency slices air, settles like morning dew. I peel and peel, fingers relish the feel as a wavering ribbon, loyal to its form tapers. Soon the pulpy ball sits unmasked, a glowing grove a glowing globe. Cupping it in palm, I enjoy the sponginess, its perfect roundness tempting me to split its symmetry. I inhale the sight, ten plump petals, my fleshy flower. I savor a sharp sweetness as they slide down my throat. Juices trickle, some find my chin. And there next to the last petal sits a mini clone. I pluck both and hold them up to the sun bursting through the kitchen window. Its morning heat sets them ablaze, and I, unafraid, turn fire eater as I drop them into my greedy mouth and grin. I wrote about New York pizza. <laughs> it took so long to get that in that shape. And um, also, when I grew up, I grew up in South Carolina, so to us, a good pizza was Chef Boardee pizza mix, and you made it. So when I came to New York, I was like, oh. So, this is, and I do make a reference to E.T., you remember the movie E.T.? Okay. Lost in the one, the only, New York pizza. It's tomato under tint so deep, your lips want to go down on its center, wilder than lava, the reddest you could slurp in. Mozzarella, Parmesan, gooey and warm and stringy and sliding around the inside of your cheeks, so white and yellow and thick you could slip down its soul food pungency all the way back to Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, wherever the cheese began. Back to the grass, the cow, the churn, the machine whirling, birthing the most succulent substance this side of where E.T. could call home. And, wouldn't, and he would not want to stop raving about the things called garlic, cheese, and pepperoni, not wanting to go back until fastening himself around the onions, the oregano, the basil riding the air over sausage, crushed so, oh, so thin and crispy, it almost breaks passing from table to spaceships, to lips, the world outside, the stars, planets, spinning in a tongue moment of pizza. <laughs> Did you dream of chocolate one rainy midnight? Last night's world had me hauling a crowd of creative writing students behind me in my car, more than would fit by daylight. 10, 15, 20, all smooshed together like cafeteria fruit salad some already preparing their wines for the hundred-word sentence assignment, their lips gooey with, just wrote this, the endless flavors of, I'm sorry, and really awful, these grovels grating like hardened candy scraping blackboard while I circled the new Godiva building, peering for our classroom, which wasn't there, nor the globe with all its agendas. In the back seats, the students with Starbucks cups spilling, smelling up the interior, we're shedding tears of every good taste, then talking of Paris, their watches already creeping past our 12.30 start time. It's not too late to write for love, they gulped. 
or, or gold dreadlocks of Santa's missing Virginia, passing by our wobbly vehicle in the parking lot, searching for us in a red hunk of metal, us hovering there like just landed hungry tourists at the college, hunting for chalk and paper and pens, looking for the man, the woman, at the top of the Eiffel Tower, where every day's a caught dream, and every day the sun shines perfect and glowing like chocolate. Thank you. I was presented this um, opportunity to write for this show. One of the challenges I decided to put to myself was um, to look at a newspaper and only use the words in the food section. So these two poems were about that. Okay. The first one is called Food for Thought. Tried to shop right and went to meat farms. Was beaned by a bean, speared by asparagus, eyed by the spuds. This was a pickle and it was a dilly. Couldn't catch up, so milked some ideas and almonds and rice. Had to slap a fresh fish. Cut off, shish, cut off the sharp cheese. Got staked out by a steak. The cookie had crumbled, was popped by a soda. Frosted at friendlies by a tart little tart. Became so fed up that I sent for a grandma and wound up with a, I've got the letter, pie. <laughs> and the other one is, should have bagged it. In a jiff gave my extra virgin Russell Stover heart my jumbo-packed thigh combo, medium to colossal size, maple honey breasts. It was all sweet potatoes, succulent red strawberries, honey bunches, very progresso. Wild caught free range, original fat free, all natural perfect meatballs. We had double coupons, all varieties, gourmet selections, five star USDA choice, all the way to the checkout. Three days only, no expiration date, no substitutes, no rain checks, no preservatives. T-boned, full line scale of goods, couple grains of dead sea salt. It's not like I had the romaine heart six pack either. Island morning. All morning, surf breaks on burnt head, giving up her secrets one word at a time. Whispers, cries, nursery rhymes, the sound of a man's voice. Eggs roll in boiling water. I watch the clock. A voice from childhood speaks. Only three minutes. The toast is down. Butter and marmalade sit on a cream-colored plate. I place the eggs in a small white bowl, carry them to the table, take my eye knife, break the egg in two, 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 two. Turn it yolk side up, pinch on grains of salt and pepper, swallow the history of my mornings. The cries of an animal rise from the beach. Someone must love it enough to search for it. Leaves are turning upward, the sky white with rain, too cold for a stranger to find me, too far for a friend to walk on unknown ground. Thank you. So for the second poem, I did a raspberry. You can see the, the shape of the raspberry there, just like my other uh, poets. And it's called How Raspberry Got Her Red. Once upon a time, when tasks were being assigned, I chose the committee that set out to design a berry. We consulted the gods, and Zeus chose white. Small little plumps filled with juicy delight we named the raspberry. But wouldn't you know it, how could we have guessed, the white did not last long on account of a handmaiden's mess. Yes, Ida of Crete was careless and rash. She pricked her fingers and caused such a gash. 
blood-red liquid spilled on fingers and vine, the raspberry stained red, alas, for all time. Now you think gods and goddesses could undo this fateful decree, but red seemed perfect, a reminder for mothers to be. Eat of my fruit, drink of my leaves, dear Zeus, we have a remedy. What once was white, now deeply red, became a berry for mortals with heavenly acclaim. Apricots. The bowl of apricots rest on the dining room table, half rotten, leaving in haste every morning of every weekday, two hands full, no time to break fast. If I had a dime for every piece of organic matter gone bad, once delicious, nutritious, and twice the price for being so, I'd be rich and not need to go anywhere in a hurry, except for weekly concertos in the park. Under moonlit and star-filled sky, sucking on apricots I paid twice the price for, from a bowl on my dining room table, on my way out, down the brick doorsteps, to the curb, looking back only to see if you are with me. <laughs> the title of the poem is, is Pie. I learned how to make soup. There was always this mystery. I've spent miles, time, energy to buy soup, mushroom soup at Whole Foods, carrot ginger soup at Tiger Lily, pea soup at Tik Tok Cafe. I was told to always start with sauteed onions and garlic. Okay, then what? Water, ingredients, boil. Seems so easy, but still not the answer. Then I bought the thing, you know, the drill bit that pulverizes. <laughs> now soup is my forte. Last night, olive oil, onions, garlic, then into the water head of cauliflower, carrots, Korean yam, zapped and good to go, made enough for a small army, or just me, for a month. <laughs> now before I die, how to make pumpkin pie. <laughs> if you'd like, go around and see where the poems are placed. Um, not necessarily to match everything particularly, but just a kind of a concept and a thought. And um, I'm happy to say that this is the third time that um, we've had poetry readings here in April. And we'll see what we come up with for next year. I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you have too. Thank you so much.